It was meant to be a game changer, an engineering masterpiece that could put Subaru on the global map. Nicknamed Head Gasket Hell, this wasn't just another engine, it was the plan. A bold, revolutionary powerhouse that didn't crack under pressure, it delivered. But what made this beast both a triumph and a ticking time bomb? Why does it still stand as one of the most legendary and infamous engines in Japanese automotive history? Let's dive into the double-edged legacy of Subaru's most talked about motor. Well, for starters, the timing of these engines was quite interesting. In the 90s, the brands around the world were putting their best foot forward, and the market was constantly being flooded with newer and better engines. Companies were focusing on their game, with engines having more displacement, and 2.5 to 3.0 liter engines becoming the new norm. Better fuel injection, long-term sealing, and metallurgy were also given a lot of attention. Big brands like Honda, Toyota, GM, and Ford were making a lot of noise, and Subaru wanted in on the action. There were other reasons for the brand to build these juggernauts as well. Subaru's parent company, Fuji Heavy Industries, played a significant role in the making of the EJ25. The FHI was a large aerospace and industrial conglomerate based in Japan. Subaru was just a division of the bigger company, and the company's focus had been on durability, mechanics, and utilitarian products. Luxurious tech and glamour weren't really given much importance within the company. But in the 90s, FHI wanted Subaru to enter the larger mainstream market, rather than focusing on just the niche four-wheel drive vehicles like they had been doing. And their primary focus was on the North American market. The U.S. market favored larger engines with more torque, and to enter such a market and compete in it, Subaru needed a larger and powerful engine. Subaru wanted to enter each area of the market that was possible. Family cars, sedans, compact crossovers, performance cars, you name it. With the FHI mindset, the brand had to be innovative and economical about the shift. The brand did not have the freedom just to go out and develop a completely brand new engine from scratch. So, what did they do? The brand's EJ series engines were already in the market. They had been modernizing their engines for some time now, but what they needed was an engine with real power. Since the brand had limited resources and it wasn't able to spend large amounts of money, which may seem unnecessary, the brand was going to base its new star child on the same pillars that its previous engines were designed on. The new EJ25 was going to be a powerful and larger engine. But the core architecture of the new beast was the same as the previous models of the EJ series, especially EJ20 and EJ22. The engine had an open deck design which meant there was a gap between the cylinders and the outer block casting allowing the coolant to flow freely around the cylinders. However, the cylinders were not supported at the top. The Boxer engine, which was horizontally opposed, was a four-cylinder design. It had been used before and was what the company was able to use in the engine with ease. This gave the engine a low center of gravity and better balance. The blocks and heads were crafted out of cast aluminum alloy. This seemed like a good idea because the aluminum was lightweight and was known to dissipate heat quickly. Aluminum was also known to have a good thermal conductivity, which would have avoided any hot spots and would have cooled down way faster than cast iron would have. The corrosion resistance of the material was just the cherry on top. The engine used a timing belt based on rubber rather than a timing chain. The timing belt is what controlled the opening and closing of the engine valves through the camshafts. The same belt also controlled the water pump. While the engine had a DOHC system in earlier years, later the brand shifted towards SOHC. The reasons for using a timing belt were simple. It would operate more quietly, it was much cheaper to manufacture, and in theory, the belt would have had been much easier to replace than a timing chain. The crankshafts for these juggernauts were either forged or made from cast iron, which varied from model to model, and were designed to be short to reduce torsional flex. The connecting rods were made from forged steel to be strong enough for the most naturally aspirated applications. 
The 133 millimeter length of the rods gave the engine good piston dwell characteristics. The cast aluminum pistons with short skirts were lightweight and improved the throttle response. The way Subaru was intended to function under the FHI led the brand to adopt a Lego-style approach to engine building. This meant the components of the engines the brand was manufacturing were interchangeable. The EJ25 shared most of its significant elements such as camshafts, cylinders, and crankshaft with the EJ22. This made aftermarket engine swaps and tuning easy. It cut down the manufacturing costs and it simplified global production and service, which helped the brand capture the larger market. So how did they scale up the engine? Well, that was simple actually. It just seemed simple. The brand increased the bore and stroke size, which is quite obvious considering the engine now had to be larger. So while the EJ22 had a 96.9 mm bore and 75 mm stroke, the EJ25 had a 99.5 mm bore and 79 mm stroke. This required the head gasket hell to have a longer stroke crankshaft, larger pistons, and narrower cylinder wall spacing. However, they used the same head bolt spacing, size, and torque patterns as the earlier engines. This proved to be one of the many mistakes made by the engineers, and it ultimately cost them a significant amount. Since the EJ25 was larger and the bore was longer, which meant the head bolts were far away from the cylinder walls, this caused an uneven clamping in places where the engine needed it the most. And since the torque patterns weren't optimized for the open deck EJ25, the torque process often left the corners and edges of the heads clamped loosely, which worsened after a few heat cycles. The open deck engine block proved to be a bad idea for the EJ25 and other aspects as well. Cylinder walls are known to flex under pressure especially during combustion. This micro movement caused a big problem. It would damage the seal between the cylinders and the head gasket, which would cause the coolant and the combustion gases to leak. Another major issue with this powerhouse was the decision to craft the block and head from aluminum. When aluminum heats up, it expands significantly, and the rate of expansion depends on the casting thickness, load, and design. And since the EJ25 had a boxer layout, it meant that both heads were positioned off to the sides. The repetitive heating cycle of the engine caused both the block and the head to expand at different rates. This pulled the head gasket across the surface repeatedly, and even this minor movement was enough to damage the head gasket when it was done so many times. And if these problems weren't enough, Subaru was also using poor material for the head gaskets. Until 1999, the brand had been using compressed layers of graphite and filler to make these gaskets. This material was prone to absorbing oil and coolant and would break down under intense pressure. Later, they switched to multi-layer steel gaskets, but those couldn't hold up either. These failed quite often due to poor prep, block flex, and uneven pressure. There was an issue with the service intervals as well. Timing belt services were often ignored, and that took a toll on the head area as well. The coolant breakdowns and electrolysts also damaged the aluminum, and since most of the engine was made from aluminum, it would damage most aluminum surfaces, which played a role in weakening the gaskets as well. Only once the failures were widespread did the company start using specialized coolant conditioners. These gasket issues, which seemed minor, gave the engine its infamous nickname, Head Gasket Hell. These problems were persistent and recurring, and they incurred significant costs. What made the people even more enraged was the fact that Subaru never actually recalled the vehicles. Instead, they sent the dealership's technical service bulletins, which explained how to fix the issue. But this was again just a band-aid and not a solution. The cost of these repairs would amount to around 50 to 70% of the car's total value for the customer, and many of these failures occurred after 70,000 miles, when the car was well out of warranty. Later on, the brand extended warranties, but it still wasn't for everyone. 
In most cases, the issues would occur again after the repair, even in remanufactured engines. What made the situation worse was that the owners were often misdiagnosed and told it was nothing until the gasket had fully blown. This caused significant outrage. The Subaru vehicles became a meme on the internet and were joked about. Internally, the engineers and service technicians were also aware of the seriousness of the issue. However, due to corporate leadership's priorities, the engines were being manufactured for an excessively long period. The management was ready to endure the humiliation as long as they could save on costs. However, the brand's reputation suffered a significant blow, and they were finally ready to do something about the elephant in the room. As the new decade began in 2011, Subaru introduced the new FB25. The head gasket issue was finally fixed and the new engines were ready to take over the market. The head gasket hell was a problematic and strange engine. However, the engine's role cannot be overlooked. The EJ25 powered most Subaru's vehicles through their crucial growth years, and it gave the brand an identity and popularity. What this engine taught the brand and the larger market was never to overlook the quality of the product just to save a few bucks. The head gasket hell went out of production for good, and more advanced engines replaced it. However, the story of these engines remained vital for car manufacturers worldwide. For more stories like these, subscribe to our channel. Let us know your thoughts on the 3.8-liter SX V6 in the comments below. See you soon!